this morning. We get to continue in our study of Luke. We began last week, uh, and we're in week two. Uh, so if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and you can stand with us. I'm going to invite Ezra to come on up. He's going to read for us this morning. Uh, Ezra's a pinch hitter today. Came through in the clutch. We had someone go down. They weren't feeling good, so, yeah. I think they knew my favorite thing was to read in front of a bunch of people, so. <clears throat> All right, uh, Luke 1, starting in verse 26. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How, how will this be since I am a virgin? That is all. You may be seated. I like the cliffhanger there. How will this be? Uh, well, we are... Um, we are continuing through the Gospel of Luke, and and just just to start, we're walking through some pretty well-worn passages. I mean, every year around this time, we come to uh, the birth narrative of Jesus. Many of you have heard sermons on this before. Maybe you're new and you're like, I haven't, and so I'm excited for you as to what we're going to walk through. But some of you are like, oh, every year we kind of navigate through this. And and what I want to encourage you with is to stay in the passage. To stay with what God has for you and allow him to surprise you again. There might be some things that you just kind of blow past, run through, but he really wants you to slow down and pay attention to. And particularly this morning, we're, we're, we're zeroing in on this idea of peace. Isaiah 26.3 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Jesus, when he was talking to his disciples in John 14, 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is the words of Jesus. I'm giving you peace. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let them neither be afraid. And then we read in Colossians 3.15 as Paul is writing to this church saying, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Peace. This elusive idea for us. Often we think of peace as just the absence of war, the, the absence of strife in our life. Maybe it's a, a moment of quiet. Maybe your idea of peace is just reading a good book as the rain is falling outside. If there was a dial in our hearts for the level of our anxiety, if we were at peace, that dial for anxiety would be turned down to zero. And peace is this theme and this promise that we see throughout the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and we see throughout the New Testament as well. But when you hear the word peace, what comes to mind? But seriously, what comes to mind? So when you think of peace, this is interactive. What comes to mind? Contentment. No conflict. Rest. Lack of anxiety. Wouldn't we all like that? Home? Calm. 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 Peace that passes all understanding, acceptance, hmm. and peace of mind, just a little peace, serenity, what was that one? Forgiveness, Ooh. 
See, all of these different things, right? We all come to this look of peace with different kind of ways of turning that gem and the light reflects in different ways and what we're longing for and what we're looking for. In first service, someone actually caught me off guard. They said, peace is home. I was like, oh, I like that. That sense of rest and being where you are meant to be dwelling at rest and contentment with all those things around you. See, peace in Hebrew is shalom. In Greek, it's erene. And this idea of peace, the meaning of this word, means not just absence of strife. It means wholeness or completeness. I love how Tim Mackey of the Bible Project talks around peace. He says peace is is like a a wall uh, that has no gaps, no cracks. If it was a brick wall, there'd be nothing missing. It's just, it's flat and full. If it was a stone, there's no crack down it. It's smooth and the surface is whole. There's a wholeness to this. And peace also carries it with this idea of complexity. When we talk around the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of his rule and reign, that's complex. And yet within it, there's a wholeness because everything is coming under the rule and reign of Christ. But when there's misalignment with him, that's when our peace is ruptured. When things no longer feel peaceful or content or a lack of strife, a lack of conflict, we're out of line with what he's caused, called us to. And I often think of this image as if you had a dam that's holding back all this water, you would know pretty quickly if there was peace, right? Because it would be a smooth and full surface, but anxiety would be filling you if you saw a hole and water just leaking out and then another hole. And, and for many of us, that's kind of how we live our life, feeling like we're just trying to plug the holes or we're trying to fill in the gaps because we, we all have them. We all feel that. Life can actually feel a little bit like Jenga, the game where you pull the bricks from and and, and at some point you pull one too many and everything comes down. And some of you are sitting in this room today and you're like, one more pull and I am toast, right? You're feeling that. Because we have relationships in our life that have broken down. People that we feel an absence of peace with. Maybe you have something unfinished, a project or something that's just kind of always burning in the back of your brain and there's this lack of resolution. Or maybe you're sitting here remembering that there's 21 days until Christmas. You better get going. Lots to be done. Again, it doesn't take much in our lives to disrupt our peace, does it? Because what disrupts our peace often consumes us. And when someone tells you, hey, just just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Often you start thinking about that thing even more. It, It just burns in your brain. And the issue is, if our source of peace is always circumstantial of how everyone's doing around us, or if our peace is up to us, then we will always find ourselves focusing on the wrong thing. Tim Keller, he he says it like this. He says, worry is not believing God will get it right. And bitterness is believing God got it wrong. When we are not at peace, we see life through the thing that is agitating us the most. So knowing how complex life is, Knowing all the different things that come our way, how can we ever hope to attain peace? And what is our source of peace? And the question sometimes is, is peace even possible? And so this morning, we we step into this story where we will see that peace is possible even in the face of the implausible and the impossible. So let's look back at Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 26 where we're picking up where we left off uh, from last weekend. Verse 26 says this, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. 
the sixth month. Remember, we are walking through the gospel account of Luke. And he's writing this biography of Jesus, and he's set out to give us a historical, accurate, eyewitness account that we can have certainty with who Jesus was. And so he's going to include a lot of dates and timelines so that we can follow along accordingly. And so he starts in the sixth month. This is referring to the sixth month of what we saw transpire last week when Zechariah was visited by an angel in the temple and that angel said, your wife Elizabeth is going to give birth to a son even though they were far beyond having children. And so now Elizabeth is in the sixth month of carrying her child. And Gabriel is on the move again. He already showed up once to speak to Zechariah. And this is the same Gabriel, remember, that showed up to speak to Daniel the prophet so many centuries before. And this is the same Gabriel who says, I stand in the presence of God. And now he's being sent to this small backwater town 15 miles east of the Sea of Galilee, a little less than a day's journey on foot. Now, when we read this, and he says, Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Uh, Really, calling Nazareth a city is generous. It was much more of a town, a very small town with a very low population. We don't hear much about Nazareth in the Hebrew scriptures at all, actually. uh, But it doesn't gain any kind of prominence until the time of Jesus. And what's interesting with Nazareth is there's a little bit of play on words here. In the Hebrew... Netzareth, Netzer, means branch. So essentially, uh, this, this angel is being sent to branch town, not necessarily the logo you want for your city, town, whatever, like, yeah, where are the branches, woo, like, not super cool. Uh, but it carries with it a lot of meaning. Because if you were a student of the Hebrew scriptures, if you were paying attention to the prophets, you would know that Isaiah and Isaiah 11 talks around this shoot, this branch that would come from the stump of Jesse. And what it's referring to is this Messiah who would come someday. Uh, Zechariah uh, speaks of this in chapter 6, 11, and 13, this very idea of this man who would come, this branch who would bring with him the counsel of peace. So even this place carries with it meaning, and Luke is pointing us to pay attention to the details. So to branch town, the angel Gabriel is sent to speak to a young woman who is twice designated as a virgin. Just read, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Again, Luke is drawing us to certain details. And the one thing he wants us to know right here is that Mary is a virgin. And I will tell you, this is not a typical designation uh, or typical way of introducing someone. It wasn't like in Jesus' day that it'd be like, yeah, this is my cousin Mary, the virgin, you know. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't normal conversation. And so there's something here that Luke's drawing out and he's making sure that we are paying attention. That this Mary has not known a man sexually. But she's also betrothed, we see. That means that she is engaged to a man named Joseph. Now, when we think of being engaged, it doesn't carry the same weight as it did in this day and age. When Mary and Joseph were betrothed, the only way you could break a betrothal was by death or by divorce. Now, they didn't live as husband and wife, but they were on the path to becoming husband and wife. So there was a lot of weight to this relationship. There was a significant amount of commitment. And so we read that Mary is betrothed to Joseph. And what I love is that Luke is not afraid to name drop in the midst of his biographical account of Jesus. He says, Joseph, you know, Joseph of the house of David. And Luke is ensuring that we know that Joseph, this one who's betrothed to Mary, he comes from very good stock. He comes from the line of David, the king by which all other kings were measured against, the one in which was supposed to have a a ruler that would reign forever and ever, that there was a Messiah that was to come from the line of David. And so Luke here is setting the table for us as we continue in the very beginning pages of his gospel account. 
So Gabriel arrives at his location and he begins to deliver his message to Mary. In verse 28, and he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Greetings, O favored one. Greetings to you that is richly blessed. Greetings to you that has been bestowed favor. Gabriel is speaking to Mary, and the first thing he states to her in this moment, showing up, is greetings, O favored one. Now, this is not to be interpreted as uh, because Mary is so great that she just has this intrinsic grace and favor. No, this is God bestowing his favor upon her. Greetings, O favored one. And what follows that? Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. I love that in the midst of this moment, the angel shows up and the first thing he wants to make clear is that God's grace is upon you and the Lord is with you. Now, some of you in this room, you could just stop right here and live in this verse because we could use an angel that would suddenly show up and remind us of this. We talk about this all the time in church, that God's grace is with you and that he is with you and yet we walk out these doors and we forget that so fast. But God's grace is upon you and he is with you. And that's where Gabriel starts this conversation with Mary. Now there's some who have interpreted this over the centuries as uh, hail Mary full of grace. As though she was set apart and she had a grace uh, that was unique to her. But again, the language that's being used here is God's grace is upon you, Mary. It's the same way when Paul is talking to the Ephesian church that he said, "Uh, Beloved, you are blessed by God. God's blessing is upon you. And so again, this grace that is being showered on Mary is not because of what she has done. It's because of what God is doing for her and through her. So the angel greets her with the reassurance, greetings, O favored one, God is with you. But verse 29, Mary's trying to take this all in, and we read that she's greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. See, as as we read this, we do need to step back. Because we've seen so many movies, uh, pictures, paintings of, of these moments. We have to remember that these are real people in real time. And Mary, this young teenage girl, is being spoken to by an angel. And now she's trying to discern what is really happening here. What is going on? What does this mean for me? What's being required of me? What is happening? How did this guy get here? What is God saying in the midst of this? See, in this moment, we can almost imagine if we put ourselves in her shoes that the anxiety would begin to rise. This being is before her, this angelic being proclaiming words with a lot of weight. And you can feel the ripples begin to disturb the surfaces of the waters of her mind as she begins to run through all the gaps in the walls and all the places that she knows she's vulnerable She's got her own fears, her own anxieties, and she's thinking, how is this happening to me? And again, I say that because all of us in this room, we, we all have gaps in our walls, don't we? Different places where the cracks show, different places where we are exposed, where when someone pushes on that, we feel it a little more acutely. Those places of insecurity, those places of doubt. And for many of us, It's the knowledge of these spaces within us that makes the idea of peace seem impossible. The unknown looms large. We don't know how to counteract this, and so we feel the the turmoil of this, this disruption deep in our bones. Again, we feel like that stack of Jenga blocks and too many have been removed and someone bumps us just wrong and it's all going to spill everywhere. But Mary in this moment, as she's trying to discern and understand what's going on, she's given some reassurance. Verse 30, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. This was her reassurance. 
I mean, let's just, again, stop right here. Before getting to the description of who this child would be, let's again take this from Mary's viewpoint. Gabriel shows up. He's like, greetings, O favored one. The Lord's with you. Hey, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. You're going to have a baby. Life's going to take form in your belly. You're going to have a child. You're going to call him Jesus, right? And Mary's sitting there, and I'm not sure that she's feeling any less afraid. Like, you're telling me I'm going to have a child. I don't know how that's possible because I, I, I know a man, but I've never known a man. Uh, and so what, what is this going to look like? This is the reassurance that she gets. But it, it doesn't stop there. there. There had to be so many questions running through her, her brain, that she's going to have a child, and you will call his name Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, Joshua. It should be noted that the name uh, Yeshua was a very popular name in Jesus' day. Meaning when Jesus of Nazareth shows up, often he's given that designation to differentiate him from all the other Jesuses people may know. Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua, Joshua, means the Lord is salvation. In Luke's account, we just kind of blow past this. In Matthew's biographical account of Jesus' life, in Matthew 121, he says, she will bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. Yahweh is salvation for he will save his people from their sins. We get a little more info on the name of Jesus. And so Mary is told, you're going to conceive a child. And let me tell you uh, just who this child will be. And so picking back up in verse 32, uh, she is told, He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, I want to take these underlined statements, and I want to throw them up on the screen, and I want to walk through just what's being said. That he will be great. He is the son of the Most High. He will be given the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will have no end. This is the list of descriptors that she's being given of just who this child will be. That he will be great. And this contrast uh, of greatness is with the rest of humanity. He's, Gabriel is saying he will be great in contrast with all we know of humanity, which is not so great. Right? And we hear that sometimes, and we're like, what do you mean? We're doing pretty good. And then you start doing a little bit of an audit, and you're like, oh, yeah, maybe we're not so great. Maybe we're not so great. We need something outside of ourselves. And he's saying Jesus is great. He will be extraordinary. Even the amazing beginnings of John, who we studied last week in the announcement of his birth, they pale in comparison to Jesus. John was said to be great in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus is just simply great. There is no qualification to his greatness other than he is great. He will be great. And he is the son of the Most High. The son of the Most High. Most High is just another way of saying God because there is none who is higher than God. And so here Gabriel is saying this Jesus will be the son of God. Jesus will not only be called the Son of the Most High, he is the Son of the Most High. And where John was called the prophet of the Most High, again, we see Jesus is shown to be greater uh, because Jesus is called the Son of God. He is God's Son. He's his representative. He is God in the flesh walking the earth. And he will be given the throne of his father, David. Again, this is pointing to the Messiahship of Jesus. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 13 and 16, we're told that David would have a lineage that would not end. And Jesus, he is of the line of David, and he will be on the throne of David. And then we read, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Uh, this phrase, uh, the house of Jacob, in Exodus 19.3, we see that referred to the people of Israel or the house of Jacob. And this king who is coming, his kingdom will be over all. And of his kingdom, it says there will be no end. And every time I read this, I can almost hear Handel's Messiah ringing in my ears, and he shall reign forever and ever. Even the song we just sang this morning speaks to that, and he will reign forever and ever. 
And so with this in mind, and with these designations still on the screen, I just want to further this point a little bit more. And I want you to just listen as I read a passage of Scripture that was uh, written as a prophet of God centuries before this ever came to be, uh, was carried along by the Spirit to speak of the one who was to come. And we have these words of Isaiah the prophet And as we read through these, I want you to see that this is essentially just a checklist going through, yes, that this is the one you have been waiting for. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Anyone with a knowledge of Hebrew scriptures would have heard these descriptors that Mary is being given about her coming baby boy, and all they would have been hearing is that the Messiah is coming. The anointed one. The one that we have hoped for that would bring peace, true shalom, true and lasting completeness and wholeness. This is the one who's coming. And what we know of Mary is that Mary knew her stuff. Mary knew the scriptures. And why do I say that? Because we're going to look next week at Mary's song that she sings and proclaims in glory to God for all that's happening. And the, the, the poem, the song that she sings is just pulled from various places of scripture all over the place. So she would have been listening in this moment as Gabriel speaking and her eyes are probably only getting bigger as she's realizing the ask that is coming before her. Now, remember, Luke has set out to write what? An orderly account and an eyewitness account. So when we're hearing these words of Mary Uh, We were assuming that he has talked to a source who has heard these stories from Mary as she's recounting them and all that is taking place. And so Mary hears all that the angel Gabriel has to say to her. And and I love what she does. She's just trying to get straight to the point. And what does she do in verse 34? Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She's like, things aren't adding up here. I'm hearing what you're throwing down, but I'm not quite picking it up, not sure how this is going to play out, what this is going to look like. And again, the the waters of her mind must just be churning, the levels beginning to rise of like, okay, I'm, I'm hearing you, but again, how do I step forward in this? Because there seems to be some gaps in this story, and I'm not feeling a lot of peace in what I'm seeing. Now, what I find interesting is that last week, when we looked at the story of Zechariah, and Zechariah was told what was going to happen, and that his wife was going to have a child, that he'd be the forebearer to the, the Messiah, that he was like, how can this be? His questions seemed to come from a place of like, I don't, I don't think this can happen. Because the response of Gabriel to Zechariah was like, because you didn't believe, you will now be mute and unable to speak. Mary's asking questions here. But her questions seem to come from a different space. This this resigned, like, I know this can be because of who you are and who you are representing. I just don't understand how it's going to happen. Because we see no rebuke in Gabriel's response. I mean, listen to how he responds to her in verse 35. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Gabriel answers her questions and begins to explain how this is all going to take place. How this is going to be that suddenly she will have a child growing in her womb. 
Now, it's important to note here that there are a number of Greek myths of gods coming to earth and sleeping with women and then give birth to children who are both mortal and immortal. And some have claimed that this is just, uh, this story here is just being borrowed from those myths to lend some credibility to the legend of Jesus. But again, what is Luke seeking to do? To write out an orderly account from eyewitnesses and those who are proclaiming the testimony of the gospel so that Theophilus, the one he's writing to, can have certainty about these things who are Jesus. Uh, these things that are being said of Jesus. And so he is taking down these eyewitness accounts. He's writing this. And what we read here of God is different from these myths and these legends These Greek gods and goddesses, even though when we read this, it seems no less impossible that a virgin will give birth to a child. But the language that's used here, that the Holy Spirit will come upon Mary and overshadow her, giving her life in in her womb, there is nothing sexual in nature about that language. That language actually ties back to when the presence of God would come over the tabernacle or the tent of meaning and he would dwell with his people. That the Spirit of God would reside much like the Spirit of God was hovering over uh, the earth when it was formless and void. That now Mary will be overshadowed in this miraculous way and she will have life in her womb. And what God is doing is just showing us once again how he can make the impossible possible. And Mary's given an assurance in this moment. Mary, I know this sounds crazy. But let me tell you what's already happening. Your cousin, Elizabeth, is six months pregnant. Now, from the way this account's told, we can assume Mary at this point didn't know that Elizabeth was pregnant. She's just finding that out. Remember, Elizabeth, when she found out she was pregnant, she went and hid herself for five months. And so there hasn't been contact with Mary and Elizabeth. And so now she's hearing that. And what's Gabriel telling Mary in this moment? I know this is so hard for you to believe, but trust me, God is already moving in this. There's already signs and there's already wonders happening. It's already in motion. And then we come to this statement after this interaction of Mary and the angel Gabriel. And it's a statement that we can we can just kind of fly by because it's oh, it's just the Christmas story. But Mary, this young woman, most likely a teenager, like early teen, mid-teens. I have to tell you, this, this story transforms in my mind when I think of my 16-year-old daughter who fits the age frame of Mary in this encounter having a conversation with the angel, hearing all these things, going, how am I going to do this? That God would show up in this tiny little town to a girl that would have been overlooked by all of society because of her position and her age. And he's showing up here saying, my favor is upon you and I'm with you. Now, here's here's what I don't want us to miss, because Luke is going to do this throughout his gospel account. So many of us can walk through life feeling unseen, so insignificant, that if we just were to, to back out of all the life, no one would even notice what we're being reminded in the very jump of this gospel account is that God is coming to the fringes, he's coming to the margins, that there is no one who is overlooked in this plan, that he is coming for you and he is coming for me, and when you feel like you are not seen, he sees you. And so here Mary is being given the the top of the puzzle box, right? This is the image we're creating here, Mary, but there's still some pieces that have to be put together. It's not all done. Here's the future that's coming, but there's still some work to be done. And this is where Mary comes to the edge of the plane, knowing she's got a parachute on her back, 
but she still has to decide if she's going to jump. There's, there's a quote that lived on my whiteboard for a long time in my office, and I pull from it often. You may have even heard me use this before, but it, it comes from a man by the name of Father Jacques Philippe, and it says this, we cannot experience the support of God unless we leave him the necessary space in which he can express himself. As long as a person who must jump with a parachute does not jump out into the void, he or she cannot feel that the cords of the parachute will support him or her because the parachute has not yet had a chance to open. One must first jump and is only later that one feels carried. To me, this is where Mary's story becomes our story. We live in the tension of this all the time. We've known the stories. We've heard of Jesus and his goodness. We hear of his offer of peace and forgiveness and love. That with him, peace has come. But we also live with the tension that peace seems to be nowhere when we look around. Nowhere when we think through our life. And so we're left with a choice. Do we step forward in trust? Do we step forward in belief? Or do we let the waters of anxiety overtake us? Do we view life through faith and trust in Jesus, or do we view life through the agitation and the disruption that we see all around us? See, the season of Advent, it reminds us that Jesus has come, but it also reminds us that Jesus will come again. We know the ending of the story. We know that our great king has come and we can experience his rule and reign here and now. And yet we know that there is still brokenness and there is pain and there is sorrow. We have the top of the puzzle box, but the pieces still have to be put together. And we still have to walk forward in the unknown, trusting the known. But what's so hard is that the, the darkness, the despair, the anxiousness, it can seem too great. I've had far too many conversations with people awaiting a diagnosis, awaiting a treatment plan, awaiting next steps, not knowing the timeline of their life. I've had far too many conversations with people that are uncertain as to, as to how they're going to provide for their family and those that they're giving care to. And they don't, they don't know how the ends are going to meet and they, they live with that turmoil. I've seen far too many experiencing family division. It's just imploding. And so the holidays just feel like a grenade in which the pin has been pulled. And they're just waiting for the explosion to come. I often think of a, a, a Christmas card that we, we receive of a family. This beautiful family of joy across their faces. But every year they mark the loss of their daughter by stamping an angel somewhere on the card. So how can we allow the peace of Christ to rule our hearts when we feel the brokenness around us? How do we step forward in faith? How do we allow the reign and rule of Christ in our life? Is that even possible? C.S. Lewis says it like this. He says, the terrible thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self all your wishes and precautions to Christ. I love this quote because I think there's a, a war in many of our hearts where we are afraid to hand over our whole self, all of our, our hopes, but also all of our fears. They keep us back from the edge of that plane, trusting that the parachute of God can carry us along. 
And I believe that as Mary listened to Gabriel in this moment, she had a choice. Would she step forward in faith or would she allow the unknown to swallow her whole? And what do we read of Mary? Verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let it be to me according to your word. What you have said, let it be. Let it be so. Your will, not mine. Your way, not mine. Let it be according to your word. Isn't this the very prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples and teaches us? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Isn't this the very same prayer that Jesus would pray before he knew he was going to the cross as he sat in the garden? Not my will, but your will be done. And this isn't just simply a a resigning yourself to fate. This isn't fatalism at its best. No, I love how Greg Penoyer states this. He says, fatalism is resigning ourselves to the inevitable. Faith is entrusting ourselves to the one who is eternally trustworthy, who is worthy of trust. Faith is not blind faith, but trust with eyes wide open. Faith does not deny the reason for anxiety, but rejects the rule of anxiety. By rejecting the rule of anxiety, we allow the peace of Christ to rule our hearts. We say no to a master we can never satisfy, and we say yes to the master who has satisfied all requirements on our behalf. And in him we have peace and rest and wholeness and contentment and home and lack of conflict, all of those are found in Christ. And what Mary models for us is that peace begins with surrender. Surrender of our will to his. Surrender of our way to his way. Surrender of our thoughts to his thoughts. I have no doubt that Mary was anxious, that she still had questions and how all this was going to play out. She still had to think through, how am I going to explain this to Joseph, to my family, to anyone? Who is possibly going to believe me in this moment? I'm just a kid. But she rejected the rule of anxiety and surrendered to something and someone greater. And the invitation for us is to do the same, to to surrender to someone greater to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So how do we begin to cultivate this and how do we begin to live this? Well, I think the first step is to acknowledge that peace is only possible through Jesus. Peace is only possible through Jesus. And what I mean when I say that is that peace is only possible through Jesus. It's not on your ability. It's not on your shoulders. It's not on you to fix it. He has come that we might have peace and wholeness and completeness in him. That rift, that disruption of peace in our life, that sin that causes chaos and death, every which way we look, he has come to restore and to reconcile, and he has paid for that in full through his body and his blood that in him we might have life. Peace is only possible through Jesus. And so we have to admit that. That peace is only possible through him. And so I need to start with him. And I need to submit to him. I think the second thing we need to do is is start small. And what do I mean by this? Because some of you are like, no, you got to surrender everything. You got to do it now. I agree with that. But when we look at the life of Mary, we just see this one magnificent moment that she's stepping into. Her life was a a life of a long obedience in the same direction. There's there's a whole period of silence we have on the life of Mary raising Jesus that we have to wonder at moments. She was like, what is really going on here? I try to give him a bath and he just keeps walking on the water. I'm just kidding. 
I'm just kidding. But it's the, the small everyday moments that matter. I don't want to. I don't want to sound too pompous, but you know, I've been coaching flag football for a couple of years, um, and uh, one of the things that I, I always tell, uh, you know, the kids is small things lead to big things. And the, the example I give them is they all want to score a touchdown. But if they can't take a handoff, they're not going to be able to score a touchdown. If they can't even hold the ball right, they're never going to get that end zone. If they can't catch the ball, they're not going to have that moment of glory. They've got to start with the fundamentals. And same with us. If we want to allow the peace of God to rule in our hearts, we have to start with the small things of our day. Each and every moment, we begin to surrender to him and submit to him, handing over to him. When we feel that deep well of anxiety that can spring up on us in a moment's notice, we acknowledge it. We don't pretend that it's not happening, but we also say, okay, this too, I give to you. I need you in this moment. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start making time each day to be with you. Not just so I can be some robot, but because I want to invest in a relationship with you. And if peace is found in you, then I want to be as close to you as I can possibly be. So I need to make room for you every day. So start small. Make one tweak this week to draw closer to Christ. Maybe that is time in the Word. Maybe that's time praying. Maybe that's time just resting and not doing anything. For some of you, right, that, that sounds like hell on earth. Like, I can't sit still. How will anything happen? Guess what? When you sleep, things are still happening. God is still in control. So practice resting in him and trusting in him. Give yourself 10 minutes to do nothing and see how you do. All the things that bubble up and be like, oh, I, I'm carrying a lot right now, aren't I? See, some of you just got a reminder right now of the task that you need to get done. You know, silence that. Don't do it. Okay. Last thing is this. Surrender to the Prince of Peace. Surrender. Begin to yield your life every day to him. If you want peace, go to the source. And he is our source of peace. Some of you may need to actively just come before him. Kneel, submit yourself, lay before him. Some of you need to just stop listening right now and start having a conversation with him. If I've been holding on to everything and I've been pretending as though I'm the king of my own life, I'm the queen of my own life, and I need to hand this all back over to you. Your will, not mine. And whatever is causing you anxiousness, lay it at the feet of Jesus. Because Jesus has come as our Prince of Peace. He has come to restore what we could never restore. And he invites us to follow him, to keep our mind stayed on him. Now, let me remind you, this doesn't mean that we will live a life free of anxiety or we just close our eyes to it. It does not mean that we're going to figure this out all perfectly this side of heaven, but it does mean when we feel that lack of peace, when we are feeling off, that the invitation stands to return to the source of peace, to once again fix our eyes on him and surrender to the one who has made peace possible. This is the invitation before each and every one of us. In this Advent season, I would encourage you to let the peace of Christ rule your heart. You pray with me. Father, as we sit in this space, uh, I just ask that you would stir within us. that your spirit would hover over our hearts, revealing to us the things that we need to hand over to you, those areas that we are uh, clinging to or keeping back from you, those areas that we are unsure that you can carry uh, what we are feeling. 
those areas where we feel like the disruption in our life is too great for you to overcome, would you remind us of who you are? For any in this room who feel as though they are unseen, God, would you... God, would you surround them? Would they awaken to your presence and your pursuit? And God, would we find, each of us, find rest in you, find home in you, find wholeness in you, for it is found nowhere else. And so, Lord, as we come and worship before you, as we come and lay these anxieties before you, would you meet us in these moments? We trust in you, the King of Peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. And in surrender to him, we find life. So as we leave from here today, let me read the words of Paul in 1 Thessalonians to you. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. He who calls you is faithful. He has you, he is with you, and he is for you. So may you trust in him this day and every day, knowing his grace and experiencing his peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week.